Well, hey, everybody. It is uh, great to be able to share another Bible class experience with you. Thank you so much for tuning in to um, Managing Stress Part 2. If you have joined us before, uh, you remember that we are in a series on threats to shalom. Uh, this was actually a series that we started several weeks back before life kind of got interrupted by COVID-19. And so we really felt like it was important to re-engage on this topic of managing stress, because obviously um, there's quite a bit of stress out there these days. So we're going to go ahead and uh, do just a little bit of reflection on what we covered last Sunday. Uh, that video recording is still available on our YouTube channel. So if you would like, feel free to access that recording as well. Uh, you may remember last Sunday uh, when we were uh, together that we, we noted that every everybody deals with stress. Um, some folks deal with it better than others, uh, but all of us experience stress in our lifetimes. Um, we see all throughout scripture, as we're going to notice today, uh, there are multiple people in multiple situations throughout the entire scope uh, of the Bible who dealt with some very stressful times. Some handled that stress very, very well, and some did not. Uh, some allowed the stress to get to them so badly that it turned them away from God. Others allowed that stress, um, basically used it as leverage to, to move closer to God. Um, but the, the key thing to realize as we start this morning is, is that no one is immune uh, from stress, for sure. You know, we offered some, um, some tips last week from uh, Mary Fairchild, who wrote a really intriguing blog post on dealing with stress. And uh, she basically articulated five really healthy decisions that we as believers uh, should consider when we find ourselves in very stressful situations. Uh, the first was to recognize the problem, um, to give ourselves a break and get help. And remember, we said last week, there's no shame in that at all. Uh, cry out to a friend, call out to a loved one, uh, reach out to a church staff person, one of our elders. Um, and just let folks know, you know, I'm really, really having a difficult time getting my head around or getting my heart around this stressful situation that I'm in. Of course, turn to God in prayer. And I'll say a lot more about that today. There's also power in meditating on the Word of God and spend time in thanksgiving and praise. And so if you want to hear more about that or plumb the depths of that a little bit deeper, I would encourage you to go back and view um, Lesson 1 on Managing Stress if you haven't had a chance to see it yet. Jesus said in John chapter 16 and verse 33, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. I want you to notice even in this passage, the promise of Jesus. In this world, you will have trouble. But I want you to notice what he says. He says, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And indeed he has. And trusting him um, in that victory is one of those um, one of those uh, most phenomenal blessings that we can experience when we think about how we're going to respond to the various stresses in our lives. I want to show you a couple of examples today. We're actually going to look at three different passages. I want to start with the book of Jonah in chapter one. It's a very familiar story, and this is what the book of Jonah tells us. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And if you've ever heard this story, you know what happens next. Uh, God says, go, and the text tells us that Jonah ran away from the Lord, and he headed for Tarshish. And of course, this didn't work out well for Jonah at all. Jonah ran away from the Lord. So in a stressful situation, what's one of the worst things you can do? Well, it's exactly what Jonah does. Jonah runs from God. And of course, what's the opposite of running from God? Well, it's running to God. And when Jonah does that, when he finally chooses to run to God, we see some pretty significant changes that take place in the story. The text tells us that Jonah obeyed the word and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming, and by the way, this is the shortest sermon in all of the Bible, 40 more days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. Uh, maybe some of you would like it if some of my sermons were that short. I want you to notice their response in verse 5, chapter 3. The Ninevites believed God, 
And so Jonah comes preaching this message, but I want you to notice the text doesn't say that they believe Jonah. The text says that they believe God. And Jonah is a messenger, of course, of God, but he's a messenger that had to go through brokenness. But just to show you how stress can impact us, you know, you would, you would think in this, in this passage that Jonah had gone through this incredible storm and through this incredible ordeal, and he had, he had seen the power of the spoken word of the Lord and how it had the ability to change hearts. And you would just think that Jonah would be in this phenomenally joyful place, right? That's not how the story ends. We look a little bit further, we see when God saw what they did and, and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. Again, you would think at this point that Jonah would just be overcome with joy. Thank you, Lord, for delivering these people from your wrath, from your judgment. But instead, to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry and he prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. And I want you to see this. This is just such a fascinating, uh, um, you know, I, I would call one of the most incongruent uh, phrases in all of Scripture. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than live. So this is a real head scratcher in a lot of ways. Um, you know, Jonah has seen again a people delivered. He should be filled with great joy. But I think Jonah wanted the Ninevites to kind of get what they had coming. Uh, I don't think he was too thrilled with this particular outcome. But if we just kind of boil it down to its most basic of levels, Jonah didn't really get what Jonah wanted. And as a result of that, well, the, the, the stress that was plaguing his head and the stress that was plaguing his heart. He just kind of gave into it. And he just said, you know, I just think I'd be better off dead. Well, that's really not a very positive way to handle stress. And God doesn't really give Jonah much uh, to hang his hat on here. <laughs> the story kind of ends on an unknown. Uh, God brings up some shade. He causes the planet to wither. The shade goes away. Uh, I think it's almost metaphoric of, okay, Jonah, if you're going to be a hothead, I'm going to let you really be a hothead, uh, literally. And uh, so it's just a fascinating, fascinating story. And I think it shows us you know, how we can just get into a really dark place in our head and in our heart, uh, how we can kind of get into a funk uh, when we don't see ourselves, um, when we don't align ourselves rather with the heart of God, when we don't align ourselves with the will of God. Fortunately, scripture gives us also some very different outcomes when we are commissioned by God um, to join him uh, in being people of good news. So when we find ourselves in stressful situations, is our first response to run to God or is it to run from God? And you know, I, I confess to you, I don't always hit that to God as my first response. There's sometimes that I, in my pride or in my arrogance, I think, well, I, I've got this, or, or uh, here's what we need to do. And, and I, I haven't really consulted the Lord. I haven't gone into the Word, and I haven't spent time in prayer. Those times when I do run to the Lord, it doesn't mean that it's not a wrestling match. Many of my prayer times are deep wrestling matches with God. Uh, many of my times in the Word, I... I find myself scratching my head and I just don't understand this. I just don't get this. And so I'm wrestling with God through the text. But I have found this, that even when I wrestle with God, it is always better to run to God than it is to run away from him. Because those times in my life when I've run away from God, those have been some of the darkest times of my life. Those have been some of the most destructive times in my life, not just in my own life, but in my family's life in the life of my friends, even in the life of churches that I've worked with. So Jonah teaches us a very powerful lesson. And if you've a track record like the one I just described, I think maybe we can relate to this decision that Jonah made and see that the more appropriate decision is to always run to God. Another question, if, if God has a different direction in mind for us, 
um, is our first go-to, uh, is it to anger? Or is our first go-to, yes, Lord? This is a really important question, I think. Because it, it is angry, it is easy sometimes to be angry at God. And it's sometimes pretty easy for that to be our first go-to. But what if we continue to pray and to be in the Word and to be shaped and molded through other spiritual disciplines and exercises so that when we're reading through Scripture, or when God reveals to us through life circumstances or through the power of his Holy Spirit or through the coaching and guidance and counseling of others, that this is the direction that seems right for us to go according to the will of the Lord. Then can we get ourselves to this place where our first go-to is, yes, Lord? A friend of mine, this was just a few years ago, his 20-something-year-old uh, son in his early 20s actually, um, developed cancer, and um, he did not survive the can uh, cancer. And I remember sitting with my friend a few weeks after this took place, and he said one of the most profound things that I've ever heard, and, and this was an expression through tears. This wasn't some shallow bumper sticker response. This was, uh, this came from a place of deep and abiding faith. And he looked uh, at me across the table, and, and he said, you know, God's God, he gets to decide. And um, I can't begin to describe how that impacted me because I was, I was face to face with this brother and I was able to, to hear in the sincerity of his tone and to see, you know, through the tears, the, the depths of this belief. And of course he, he mourned the passing of his son. And of course he still deeply felt the hurt and the pain and, and all of the other emotions that go um, with those types of very difficult life experiences. But that observation, that truth, that deep belief that God is God and God gets to decide, that's a yes, Lord moment. And um, I want to be there. And I hope you do too. Uh, let's look at a couple of examples from scripture, I think, that can it can showcase what this looks like uh, for those who, who laid it all on the line for the will of God. Like in Acts chapter 21, I'm going to start reading in verse 10. After we had been in Caesarea a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, and he tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. And so Agabus prophesies what's going to happen to Paul once Paul gets to Jerusalem. And um, I would assume Agabus is pretty worked up. I don't see him in this situation going, uh, this is what's going to happen. You know, I don't see a monotone response here. I, I'm, I'm assuming he's pretty animated. I'm assuming he is, he's pretty emotional. Um, you know, I can, I can just hear the, the tone of his voice and, and the urgency in his message. And I think it translates to those who are around Paul because the text tells us, and this is Luke who's writing this account. So it's Luke and, and probably Philip and maybe even Philip's daughters and many others who are gathered around the scene and, and hear the urgency in, in, in Agabus's voice. And, and Luke reports that when we heard this, we and the people who were there, we pleaded with Paul, Paul, don't go up to Jerusalem because they knew what going to Jerusalem meant. But I want you to see Paul's answer. Why are you weeping? And this is really important, this next question. Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up. And we all said, the Lord's will be done. There's a couple of really interesting things that are happening here. Why are you weeping? You know, why are you, why are you torn all to pieces? <laughs> uh, because this is the will of the Lord. 
why are you breaking my heart? I don't, I don't think it was the weeping that was breaking his heart. I think what was breaking his heart was that, that, that he was on a mission from the Lord, um, a specific uh, task to, to go to Jerusalem, and they were urging him not to follow the will of the Lord. And I think Paul was asking, why are you asking me uh, to, to, to compromise this mission of God? Why are you asking me to discard the will of the Lord and push it over to the side just for my own, for the sake of my physical health or my, my emotional well-being or my mental well-being? Um, Paul saw and he recognized the greater spiritual reality that was in play here. He knew the will of the Lord, and he would not be dissuaded. I just think it's a beautiful story. Yeah. And I want you to notice this phrase here, uh, that everybody came into agreement, and they all said, the Lord's will be done. A uh, powerful, uh, powerful place to get to uh, when we think about these, these times that just seem to overwhelm us. Uh, and then here's the ultimate example, I think, in all of Scripture. Jesus is in, uh, I'm going to guess, emotionally speaking, the most stressful time of his earthly existence. And Matthew 26 and verse 39, we read this, this um, description of what's happening. Going a little, a little farther, and Jesus is in the garden. He fell with his face to the ground. And he prayed, my father, if it's possible, may this cup, may what I'm about to experience, if there's any other way, take it from me. But I want you to notice what Jesus says. He says, yet not as I will, but as you will. The text doesn't stop there. Um, there's this phrase, yet not as I will, but as you will. Jesus went away a second time. And he prayed, my father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, here's our phrase again, may your will be done, verse 42. And there are several key characteristics when we look at these passages. Um, the Jonah passage, which is not a very positive example of how to manage stress. Uh, the Paul uh, passage, which certainly gives us great insight into what happens when we're resolute, and then the Jesus passage, which shows us, uh, I think, the ultimate example of dealing with, with uh, traumatic stress, very painful situations. First of all, there's a willingness to emote in each of these characters. And if you go back and look at each one of those passages, there's some really intriguing things that we see here. You know, Jonah, he really kind of let God have it in prayer. Uh, he didn't really pull any punches. Um, he wasn't very happy with God at all. But even though Jonah wasn't very happy with God, and even though God had to really use some pretty dire circumstances to get Jonah's attention, right. I think one of the things that we can learn from this text is that 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 emoting, that that being emotional, not not just trying to always sound pious in our prayers or to always make our prayers sound holy or righteous. Um, you know, God's okay if we just kind of lay everything out on the table. It's perfectly fine with God who made us, by the way, as emotive beings. I think it's perfectly okay with God for us to emote. There's a wonderful class going on, by the way, uh, on handling our emotions as, uh, as uh, believers. And uh, you can check that class just by looking on our YouTube channel. It's hosted by uh, the Duncans. And I uh, really encourage you to check that out. But, but in all of these episodes, there's this willingness to emote. Even, even Jesus, uh, is, is just, is, we're, we're able to see his emotions in the garden. And he brings those emotions to the Father. Um, again, it's not just just pious language. He's not trying to sound, uh, you know, pious and 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 saint like. He's it's just the son having the conversation with his with his father. And uh, so I encourage you to think about this. Cry out to God. If you're angry, be angry. If you're sad, be sad. If you're filled with joy, be filled with joy. Don't don't hide that. Don't hide that from the Lord. 
Also, we see some additional key characteristic, another key characteristic here, and that is just the power of prayer. Um, in the Jonah example, there's power in prayer. Uh, even though Jonah needs multiple attitude adjustments, still, there's power in prayer. We see over and over and over again in the letters of Paul how often he prays for people and with people and over people and over circumstances. And so when Paul gets to this place that his, his, um, it's time to go to Jerusalem, he's prayed up. Paul's ready. He doesn't have to second guess this for him. You know, we're, we're in a moment right now where we have a phenomenal opportunity to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. So if we're prayed up, I'm pretty sure it's going to be much easier to recognize those ways that we can bless others around us. Mm -hmm. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, uh, Paul encourages uh, people who he loves very dearly in Jesus. And through faith in Jesus, we may approach God uh, with freedom and confidence. And so our Father, our Father longs to hear our prayers. He longs to have us in his presence. And so go there, go there. Uh, and, and my hope and my prayer for you is, is that prayer will be a very, very powerful tool um, in this, this, this season, and not just this season, but, but every day of our lives when we, when we lay everything before our Father in heaven. Uh, also, another key characteristic of, of, you know, managing stress, dealing with stress, putting stress into its proper perspective, I call it the importance of the ask. And by that, I mean, we got to ask God um, to, to deliver us. Uh, we ask God for a cure. We ask God um, for... Um, for his blessings on those who are hurting. We ask God for answers. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on and on, right? But here's something that's really important to remember. It's important to, to ask. And Paul wasn't afraid to ask God to take away his thorn in the flesh. We know at least three times and maybe more, uh, Paul asked for that thorn to be removed. Jesus is not afraid to approach his father and ask him uh, if there's any other way um, for this, uh, this cup to pass. Um, and so it's very important that we, we ask our Father in heaven um, for that which we, we feel that is a critical need for us or a critical need for those within our circles of influence or, or even for people that we don't know. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul writes, don't be anxious about anything. Whew, can we just stop there for a second and breathe that verse in very deeply? Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, you hear that? Every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So you know what, church? It's okay to ask. Sometimes God's answer may be no, but let's go back to something that we said a little bit earlier. Remember, God is God, and he gets to decide. So it is his will that we're interested in. And when God says no, it's not a time to fold up our arms and to pout and, well, I'm not getting my way, so obviously God's not really God. I think it's actually an opportunity for us to just pause and to reflect, okay, Lord, you're telling me no. So what is it you want me to learn? Sometimes we learn not so much by a direct answer, but we learn by just simply being obedient. I learn by trusting the Lord, and I learn by living into his promises. And I may not ever have the conscious aha moment. I may never have the light bulb that goes off in my mind, but that's okay, because I'm learning to be obedient. And who knows, later in my life, I may be tested even more than I'm being tested right now. As I look, as I see God carrying me through this time of testing, then I can hope that I'm going to be 
um, even more prepared for that next round of testing. Uh, and that leads to this additional characteristic, and, and that's just to be at a place where ultimately uh, you totally trust in the Lord, totally trust Him. And I, I confess to you, I have not always done that. There have been times in my life that I trusted me more than I trusted God, or I trusted my, um, my possessions more than I trusted God, or I listened to my wants more than I listened to God. And every time I've done that, it's always been a train wreck. But when I trust the Lord, it doesn't mean that the, the, the difficulty light switch gets flipped in the other direction. It's still difficult times, even when we do trust in God. But I know when I do trust in him, there's always a, a deeper and a much much more abiding peace that fills my spirit. I don't get my feathers ruffled as quickly. I don't find myself being as discombobulated as quickly. I don't find myself living in duplicity, um, which in and of itself is a horrific place to be. You know, when Paul had his Damascus Road moment and the scales fell from his eyes and he gave his heart fully to the Lord and his mind and in his life, he fully gave it to the Lord found himself time and time again in very, very difficult situations, in very difficult circumstances, yet he never wavered, and he continued to trust. And my goodness, just look at the New Testament, how much of his writings uh, reflect the power of, uh, of Jesus and um, what it meant not just only to those churches that he was writing to centuries ago, but, but even to us today. So we think about those examples, but, but then there's this ultimate example of Jesus who trusted his father and the will of his father, knowing what the cost was going to be. He trusted that um, he was going to have to walk through this, this um, incredible pain and shame and humiliation, but he trusted what was on the other side of it as well. And I hope that we're doing that right now. You know, what we're experiencing is really nothing compared to what Jesus experienced, but, um, but it is difficult. And so I, I hope that we're, we're trusting what's on the other side of it. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 29, the Proverbs writer notes, fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. There's a lot of fear out there today. A lot of that fear is being fanned by media. Uh, some of it's right. Some of it, who knows? <laughs> it's, it's literally all over the map. Uh, fear of the unknown is real. Uh, fear of additional um, income loss. Uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen next? All of that's very real, and I'm not diminishing any of it. Um, but no person, no uh, job, um, no degree, no whatever it is, fill in the blank, is ever going to be able to replace what God can do and what we have in him and what we have through his son, Jesus. And so I want to encourage you today to, to trust in the Lord and know that you are, uh, know that you're safe in him. Because there's this last characteristic that I want us to think about. There's, there's tremendous freedom in just letting God take it. Uh, letting him have the stressful situations that sometimes can overwhelm our mind or can overwhelm our hearts. Just, just let it go. In 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, Paul writes, The Lord is a spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And you know what? The Spirit of the Lord is in each one of us. Uh, that's a promise from, from Jesus to his followers. It is a promise of the Lord uh, to those who believe that we are people of spirit. We are people who are filled with the Spirit. And because of that, we're people of freedom. We don't have to hang on to uh, any stressor, any pressure. It doesn't mean we abdicate it. I think that's the downside of the, the letting go and letting God. That's a limitation. You know, we've got a part to play in this too. 
and that is to be responsible for those things we need to be responsible for, to respond uh, when the Spirit of God says go, to respond and to, and to play our part in making sure that uh, we are indeed being the hands and feet of Jesus, that we are following uh, the leading of our Father, and we're living into that. And when we do that, we can release ourselves of, of so much need for self want, self desire, and uh, be about what God wants and about what God desires. And you know, it's constantly going to be um, a work in progress. We are constantly a work in progress. And I just encourage you to go back and look at those passages that we mentioned today, uh, live into these characteristics. Uh, model them in your own heart, model them in your own mind, and just see what happens as God transforms us over time. Uh, so appreciate our time together today. I want to pray out, and uh, the lesson is yours. God, thanks for the blessing of uh, being in your word. Thank you, Father, for examples of old uh, individuals like Jonah who really struggled to trust and uh, when he did, Father, again, when he gave way to your will, wonderful things happened. Thank you for the marvelous example of Paul. Thank you, Father, for the incredible example of Jesus. And help us, Lord, to trust him and to lean into his promises and into your promises, Father, all to your honor, all to your glory. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good rest of the day, everyone.